can. Test, test, can you hear me? Holly, if you hear me. <laughs> okay, let's try this again. Let's try this again. All right, so can you hear me now? Test, test, test. Let me know if you can hear me, guys, because, uh, hey, man, Mauser. <laughs> you wanna, how do you pronounce that? Is it Moiser or Mauser? <laughs> okay, you guys can hear me. Good, 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 good. Maurice says he can hear. Good. I think there was some weird thing that didn't go. I'm going to have to email one of my – I have a lady friend who I, whom I emailed that – uh, I'll be with you in a second here. Uh, let me take care of this real quick, guys. Um, uh, so just check out YouTube page. Back warrior lures and you find a live stream. Sorry for the spelling. He's like a former English teacher. <laughs> Sometimes I misspell words. So okay, we've got two, three, one in the house, whatever. All right. So um, um, so I want to talk about. Uh, are you too old to start a YouTube channel? That seems like we've lost a few. Seems like maybe people didn't get back on afterward. That's fine. I mean, it just happens like that. And, um, you know, it, it came, I was on a live chat with, um, I can't pronounce the guy's name. I think it's Vorhist Fly Fishing or whatever. He does a lot of fly fishing. He has some really good videos out. Uh, I can't remember. Yeah, I definitely would appreciate the thumbs up. <laughs> I always, um, and I'm grateful of, of anybody who watches my videos. And so, uh, but it, he, there was a guy, sorry for the shaking. There was a guy on his, that on his live stream who was, you know, wanting to get started in YouTube, wanting to get fishing videos up, but just was sort of dragging his feet and not very confident on screen or whatever. And just, and 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 Voris was just uh, I, I can't pronounce his name. I just you know, I have a problem pronouncing people's names. <laughs> if you haven't found out, and he just kept goading. Hey, look, I'm just gonna drive up there and we're gonna put a video together. And I'm, and I also have a lady friend who's an English teacher who has a vast experience and knowledge in life that can really you know. And I think part of my audience is an older audience. A, a, most of my audience is, a, is an older audience who um, just, um, you know, you know, there's a lot of young people on YouTube. It's a new technology, and a lot of the YouTubers out there, you, they're young and they're just everything's hyper and everything's like <laughs> everything's like that. And I'm like, I, I just can't can't watch it. And I do everything at a slower pace of life, and I do everything, you know, fashion and form that's reminiscent of something in the past. I mean, and I think that the older audience has a has something to offer because you've seen a lot, you've done a lot, you've seen what works, you've seen what doesn't, and you have a lot to pass on. There's an unsaid thing in fly fishing and fishing in general is just take what you have. Take what you were taught, pass it on, expand on that knowledge, pass it on so that it lives on. Or, you know, or take what you have and use it to shape people's the way they think about things. And um, that's something that I think should be done and passed on. And a lot of people just don't necessarily think they can do it. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people who, uh, think about starting a YouTube channel, but just don't for some reason. I just don't understand why they don't. They just may not have a you know background and and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. 
Mauser, yeah, I, I remember I remember a conversation you and I had a while back. You gave me some advice, and that advice has helped me to be more confident in recording myself. That my hat's off to you, sir. Thank you dearly. I really don't remember what that advice was. I'm happy that it helped you because that's the whole purpose. See, I'm see, there's some YouTube channels that are out there to entertain you. They're just there for entertainment. That's not what I'm here to do. If you just want to be entertained, I'm here to teach you. I'm here to challenge the way you think. I'm here to change the way you think. I'm here to motivate you. I'm here to cause you to make a decision and go out and do something, whether it's pick up a fly rod for the first time or to try jug fishing for the first time or put bait on a fly for the first time or to, in this case, try to start your own YouTube channel or or whatever it is. I mean, that's the whole point. It's, it's by and large, I'm more interested in changing the world. I'm more interested in, in changing, doing what I can to, to you know, to change the world than I am just entertaining people. Because quite frankly, I found that people who just want to be entertained, one, they don't want to buy anything. Two, they don't want to commit to anything. And three, they just sort of put themselves at the center of the universe where they think that everything's about their entertainment, kind of like, well, anyway, we won't go there. But, um, you know, when you, when you, so for those of you just joining in, it seems like I think people have got the other message because the other live stream in it, I just, something went just for everybody. No, this is kind of start all over. The other live stream didn't have any sound and it was one little, there was some little setting that I forgot to set before we started and it's hidden in a bunch of menus. It makes it not so easy. And I just sort of forgot to, to do that because I'm using the microphone here. Not, I'm not using, I'm not using this microphone here through my camera or anything. So it's just one of those technical things that we probably don't care about and that's okay. So I'm happy people have come back. Um, people seem to be coming and going. Uh, but the, the, the talk today, and look, I want your guys' opinion. This this talk here, not just me talking, but you put your opinions in here. You got to run now. I'm headed to the pond. Yeah, I understand. This is not the best time of day for people. I just do these whenever I do it. I'm probably not going to go long today because I've, I've got a lot of work to do. But I do want to do these uh, live streams on Fridays. Let me know what's a good time for most of you people. I don't imagine the evenings are good, but, um, it, you know, it, it, you know, so... So how do you start your own YouTube channel? I think the first thing you need to do is just sit down with a pencil and piece of paper, take 40 days, take a month, you know, uh, even if it's just a, you know, spend some time on the weekend, just you, nobody else. You may, you know, with a pencil, piece of paper and just jot down some ideas, you know, look back through your whole life and determine what sort of patterns have you seen come up and go. Yeah. Maurice is still here. Thanks, man. <laughs> it's all right. Um, you know, and so you, you need to sit down, sort of take an inventory of your life. What sort of things keep coming up and coming back to you over the course of a lifetime? You know, me, I've been fishing all my life. I've been doing this my whole life. I've been blogging ever since I was in college, way back in the 90s, you know, and then I started a podcast years ago about gardening and that led to a YouTube channel about gardening the old Greenhorn Gardening YouTube channel. It's still up. I don't post anything there anymore. But, you know, I, when I when I started doing this, I said, what do I really want to do, you know? It was fishing. Fishing was the thing that always kept coming back up. You had a million dollars, what would you do? I'd just go fishing, right? But I also have, you take a list of your talents. What a burger. Hashtag not sponsored, you know? Um... You know, you, you list skills and talents. I have some skill as a as a as an instructor or a teacher or someone who can effectively communicate knowledge to and cause someone else to go take action as to what it is that they're doing, and um, influence them to go change their life for the better. I mean, that, that's just who I am. It's just what I do. And uh, and so once you take your inventory of your life and you know what you're good at, what you're not good at, what your interests are, then it's just a matter of sort of doing a little preliminary research on that 
let's say your thing is uh, you love, you used to love uh, mountain climbing or something, anything, whatever it is. Well, you just get on and see if you can't find some mountain climbing channels on YouTube, which there are a great many. And I, that's one of the things I watch a lot is mountain climbing videos, particularly mountain climbing documentaries. And you probably should see some similarities between my, the way my fishing videos are done and the way some of these mountain climbing documentaries are done. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> once you do that, then you have to ask yourself, are you going to, do you want to do this for a career or do you just want to do this as a hobby? That's the net. That's the, that's really the big fork in the road. Cause if it's just a hobby, get a camera and start shooting this afternoon, put something up and just be done with it. This, but if you want to do this, if you have any aspiration to do this professionally, yes, it's you're going to have to invest in your own education because this is not the type of thing that you go to college to learn to do. In fact, colleges seek out people like <laughs> me, quite frankly, to teach their people, you know, not that I've been uh, propositioned in that way. It's just that, but it happens. I mean, I've seen colleges quote bloggers and stuff in their English departments. And I'm like, okay, in this backwards, shouldn't the blogger be quoting some professor from the university? No, the college is quoting the blogger. But that just lets you know where the real flow of knowledge is, is from the people who are doing it in and every day, the people who have the real life experience, the people who have the ability to get out here and motivate and influence people for the better. That's where the real knowledge is growing. And that's where the real people are being influenced. And uh, we follow you from Turkey. Are you kidding, man? Turkey, like, like. Turkey, like Asia Minor, like the whole ancient world, Turkey. Are you serious? 49, feel young, and you feel young too. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you get older, your brain, you don't think old. I am a kind of an old, craggy old man. I got the beard, and I get tired easy, and I get fed up with society at times, and I'm like, okay, this is crazy, you know? But um, but yeah, thanks. That turkey, I see. That's what we're talking about. Here I am, live streaming, and here's a guy from Turkey. Yeah, you know, that's funny. I mean, there are no geographic boundaries anymore. That's what this thing really is. YouTube is more than just a video distribution platform. It's a complete social media platform where you can connect with people all around the world, right? Yeah, you retire when you die, then you're too old. Yeah, I believe that too, man. I mean, it's like, that's that's how I was raised. You retire when you die. You, you, you know, you, you know, you, you know, you know, my dad, you know how my dad died back in 2007? I can share this. He, um, he died on a fishing trip. He was in Florida. He was at one of these really awesome bluegill fishing lakes where the bluegill get you know, you got almost have to have, um, you almost have to have bass gear to catch the bluegill. You know what I'm saying? These big bluegill, right? And he was fishing in one of these lakes down there in the somewhere in the Panhandle. Um, and he had a heart attack and died. Basically, what happened was he, you know, he had 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 a, had a stroke, but he had gotten a lot healthier to where he could actually get out in the boat by himself. Probably should not have been out there by himself, but he did. Dad had a tendency to carry a little bit too much weight in the boat. He carried these big honking anchors that were really just too heavy, I personally believe. And he would always anchor off the front and the rear. And they always tell you never to anchor off the rear of the boat. Well, guess what happened? Anchored off the rear of the boat. A boat came splashing past, started taking on water. Boat started to sink. And fortunately, he had his life jacket on. But the only way... Uh, Another boater saw him in distress, came and helped him, and they just they got they they able to get him back to shore, and he died on the shore. I'm like, okay, if I'm gonna go, that's gonna be it. All right, if I'm, I want to have a either a rod in my hand, or I'm gonna kill over on here on the fly time rise. You know, I don't have time. You know, you know, I wish my body were 28. It'd be I kind of would like to climb, you know, mountains because I kind of like the idea of mountain climbing and things, but I. My body is a little weak, and I could probably work out and get in good enough shape to do that. But, uh, you know, I'm happy doing what I'm doing. So 
the idea, are you too old to start a YouTube channel? And the answer by and large is no, because some of my favorite YouTubers are older than me. You guys know a guy named Hickok45? He, this guy's an old school teacher. He's an old school teacher taught back in the 70s. And I don't know his whole career, but he just has a firearms channel where he shoots firearms in his shooting range. The guy has like, I don't know how many subscribers, something like last time I watched probably about 3 million, maybe like five by now, but you know, um, one, another, one of my favorite YouTubers is an older fellow, um, Vago Maradian at the daily defense and aerospace report. I believe that's the name of it. He has like, he's an older fellow. He used to work in the Pentagon reports on military technology. He's a reporter reports on military technologies, particularly aviation centric. Uh, if you look at his channel, he doesn't have a lot of subscribers, but he's got sponsorship from like Boeing and Leonardo DRS. Just They're just directly supporting his channel. He has ties with all kinds of think tanks in DC. And, he, and that's the one place I can go to get news of military technologies around the world here in the United States, China, Russia, UK, anywhere. He, he, go, they, he goes around to all these major events he covers major events like the Fumbra Air Show in Britain, major air shows here in the States and really all around the world. He'll be in the Middle East at, with the big Bahrain. I don't know if he's done to the Bahrain Air Show. Or the point is he's an older gentleman who's doing this professionally, who's going directly to the big companies whom he's built a relationship with over all the years that he worked in the Pentagon. I think he used to be in Air Force News or something like that. And he's just doing what he did in Air Force News on YouTube. That's what's possible now, right? There's no reason you can't do a live broadcast from whatever uh, whatever show or trade show or military symposium, just bam, that's what's possible. That's what this, it, it's, 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 it's incredible and unbelievable. Uh, another fella I like is Paul Harrell. He is another firearms channel. I don't own any firearms, don't really want to own any firearms, uh, but I like the type of person that, I'm a very creative, artistic person, and I find a lot of these people are more data-centric, and they think in a way that's more analytical, and that sort of helps me, just watching the way they think. Like Paul Harrell, he was an ex-Marine instructor. He was in the National Guard or, or either in the reserves. He taught people how to shoot in the Marines. He studied all these FBI cases and shootouts and battles over the years. Check out Paul Harrell's uh, channel, and he he will, it, as much as possible, test in a, you could say scientific way, although he's not in a lab or anything. He's just on his shooting range that he shoots at in Oregon. And this guy could be right here in Alabama, but he's in Oregon, right? And he's just, this is the culture that uh, sort of you grow up in here in Alabama. You know, people aren't afraid of firearms and things. And he's, he shows you, hey, this is why this bullet is not effective because he'll go get, he'll go to the meat store and get like 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 he'll buy a ham not a ham but he'll buy ribs to simulate human ribs he'll go to the to the thrift store and buy leather jackets or or fleece jackets to simulate clothing and skin and he will actually sit there with the gun at so many yards with a chronograph and shoot this bullet with this gun at this range in very detailed document the results and so it's all scientific and gosh, it were it's a fascinating channel. It's absolutely fascinating. There was another guy, um, Project Farm. He's another guy, older fella, who all he, he does the same sort of thing. A lot of test and experiment channels, educational channels like that. Where the guy, he will, he's the guy who he just blows up these harbor freight engines on purpose, you know. He'll like, okay, can this harbor freight engine run on Crisco? <laughs> yeah, that guy. He'll put, he'll put freaking, he'll put freaking, he'll put, he'll put WD forty or something in the engine and see how long it'll run until absolute failure. Do you think that has any value for someone like me who keeps blowing up these engines as I'm building them? That does have value. And he's an older guy. Again, just I forget. Last time he had just hundreds of thousands of subscribers. Uh, there was another guy. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, Okay, let's see. Hickok will probably die shooting. Yeah, yeah, he will. Don't forget the thumbs up. Okay, thanks, guy. Thanks, dude. 
<laughs> yeah, Hawk Knives uh, mentioned that, yeah, a lot of people feeling they're older and they feel like they're 28, um, you know, working year round, working uh, probably work or circles around a 28 year old. I tell you what, my mom, dude, maybe I should have her on the channel sometimes. Dude, she could, <laughs> she's like in her 80s and she can outwork a 40 year old, you know, she, she can. It's just how it is. Um, that's one of the things that we bring. We bring a work ethic that perhaps the younger generation doesn't have because we know what it means to work hard and to work for a long time without seeing benefits. I can't tell you the number of times I've seen some youngsters who get on YouTube, put up five videos, and they're crying about not having much results. And I'm like, okay, I've got 600 videos up. <laughs> I've got you know, I've been starting doing this since about 2014, and I'm perfectly happy with the results I'm having. I definitely want things to accelerate, and they are. But I, but I think there's a certain person of a certain era that understood that it takes a long period of hard work for anything worthwhile to come to fruition, and that's a life lesson that a lot of older people have learned that a lot of younger people have yet to learn. And I think YouTube is a great sort of equalizer in demonstrating that. I was trying to think, oh, here's another guy who's an older fella whom I like. Um, Engineering Explained. Check out his channel. He's a guy, I, I guess he's, and he is an engineer, I think he works in the automotive industry. I'm not sure. Who, I think he's doing, I guess he does consulting work with automotive manufacturers. But all he does is teach people how car engines work. That's all he does. Teach people, well, how do, how do cars make horsepower? What does four-wheel drive do? He goes through some of the latest technologies in automotive technology and explain exactly how they work. A lot For, for many years in his early videos, all he had was just a, a chalkboard um, with a whiteboard and just drawing examples of how it works. How is it a diesel engine work? How is that a turbocharger works compared to a supercharger? How is it that all-wheel drive is different than four-wheel drive? You know, how is it that engines produce power and how is that power increased and how does that affect performance? Do you think that has any value for what I'm doing with these engines that I keep building? incredibly valuable to me. Older gentlemen, videos are not the most exciting, but who cares? He's bringing value because what he has learned in his training and years, both formally trained and his life experience, has great value in changing the way I think about how engines are built. Another older fella whom I love, who really is my favorite YouTuber, Andrew St. Pierre White. Check out 4 x Overland. This guy is actually like a TV personality. Um, he's um, he's um, um, overlanding. Uh, we call it safaris in the United States or four-wheel drive or expeditions maybe. That's what he does. He builds off-road trucks and goes on these worldwide expeditions just like in National Geographic. But he, he's British. He cut, he had most of his career in South Africa because there's a lot of off-roading in South Africa for obvious, well, in Africa period for obvious reasons. And then he recently, I think, moved to Australia for the same reasons. And so for X Overland, all he does is build four-wheel drive trucks and drives them all over the world on these really crazy obscure places all across deserts and everything. Um, older gentleman, you know, he was doing selfie content back in the 70s. You know, <laughs> you know, you look at some of his latest videos, he's got footage, he's got old tapes, old tapes, just racks and racks and racks of old footage that he's been doing just like we're doing here on YouTube. He was, he was just doing it back in the 70s and the 80s. And he first got his first, I uh, forget when he got his first TV gig, but back in that day, all you could do was get on TV. And it's very expensive. But now, you know, let me show you my camera. This thing, 
this camera, this camera, you guys maybe have never seen this model camera. This thing, this thing, if we were to go back to 1960, this camera would be worth a million dollars. Because back in the 60s, you would have to have a school bus full of equipment, generators, power supplies, processing, just to capture images. And then you'd have to send that film off to a lab to process it. And then you have to send the tape and the film to a cutting floor that's about as big as this room, well, bigger than this room, and almost you know the size of half a house just to edit it all together. And then you've seen how big projectors are in the movie theaters to play this stuff back. It's insane. This little camera, this GH4, this is considered old. A lot of people consider this camera old, this model. Um, you can do what took entire teams of people to do back in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And unconsequentially, this lens is from the is 70s. It's a, I use old lenses with a new camera. It's a Panasonic GH4, old camera, audio preamp, um, you know, and this is for a longer lens to weight it. And, but, but, you know, your cell phone has so much processing power, right? There's no reason you can't do, you can't get, you, you can easily get started on YouTube with just a cell phone. That's all you need to get started. Look at some of my old videos, the first videos. I hate those videos, but that's what I had. And I, all I had was a little um, GoPro type camera. It was a Contour Roam. I don't even know if it still make it, but um, you don't need a lot of equipment. Now, as time's gone on, I, 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 and I began shooting and I began seeing deficiencies in the equipment that I had and I wanted to upgrade to something bigger, better, better, all that kind of thing. But it doesn't mean that you have to get started with something like this. And this is actually very small. Most cinema cameras, what, this is how I have this rig because I don't use it for photos at all. Um, uh, just to go through it real quick, microphone, preamp, camera body, lens. Uh, this is a rail system for very long, long lenses to support it because this is a very small mount and this is actually a very big lens um, to support it for the long lenses. But uh, my, my point is you don't have, your cell phone has everything you need to get started. What you really need to focus on is your education and your training. You know, really sit down, come up with what you want to do, then define why you want to do it. And then it's a matter of, OK, what equipment am I going to need to do it? What equipment do I want? You know, and what equipment do I have? And how can I get started by the end of the week? Because that's the number one thing. Um, you know, there's plenty of people. Uh, Roberto Blake is a great person to look at for how do I get started in, in YouTube? There's any number of guys like that, but he's always the one that comes to mind first for me. Um, you know, it, it's 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 um, it's an incredible platform that you have people like Vago Maradian who are former professionals in broadcast and Andrew St. Pierre White who are former professionals in broadcast and who can use this YouTube as professionally as they ever did in the traditional broadcast world. And then you have people like me who are off in some small town in Alabama or Paul Harrell who's way out west in the woods of Oregon or 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 or, or um, Hickok 45 who's up in the woods of Tennessee just shooting guns and I'm just fishing and and yet we can all come together on this same platform to take the life experience and knowledge that we have to use to change people's opinions about what's really going on out here and that's really what it's all about. Anyway, um, that's about all I had to say. But um, i trying to thank some resources. Um, yeah, I would. Yeah, Roberto Blake is what I would go to. Um, probably the number one most inspirational thing I've probably ever read is the Wright Brothers' Early History of the Airplane. It's in public domain. It's you can probably find it anywhere online. Probably Project Gutenberg has it, but there's a point where they talk about um, uh, the, they were just bicycle shop owners 
but they also had a machine shop. They could pretty much build whatever they wanted. And they were real fans of aviation, primarily because of their father. But at that time, there was no real airplanes. There was just experiments, and it was all just academic papers and stuff like that. And they studied all that stuff. But Otto Lilienthal, a lot of the people whom they admired started, they started getting killed. Um, I forget, uh, Langley, the guy, he stopped producing paper, he stopped writing papers and stuff. And there was a, there was a language about, uh, I forget when Otto Lilienthal died, but uh, they started in 1900 because there was simply nobody doing what they really loved, which was aviation. And after two years of experiments, they threw everything away they had done because the science that was that they based everything on was in error, right? They had to throw it all away and start all over. Basically, had to build their own wind tunnel, you know, big windy hill in North Carolina, right, and start all over. And within about two years after that, they had built their first world's first airplane, right? So a lot of it is you just have to step out in confidence and get started. And I think perhaps that's a barrier. It's a new technology. A lot of people may not like it. Okay, let's see. Waving at you from a snowy Colorado morning. Dude, it snows like once every 15 years here. So thanks for showing up. Thank you. That's Michael takes the gun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, if it does snow, it's usually either snow flurries and if it does stick, it sticks for like 10 minutes. <laughs> you know, really, though, it, it'll it'll snow. We get that one freak ice storm or something that comes in. And like, you remember Atlanta a few years ago, they shut down the whole town just because it snowed. <laughs> That's how it is here. Uh, here we have, they have sand. We don't, do, we don't do salt, but we have sand. They just put sand on all the bridges and some of the slippier, slippy roadways. And, and that works fine for down here. You know, after about a day or so, it, it just thaws out. Kind of wish we had snow, but everybody who lives in snow country says, hate the snow moving down south. I don't, I don't have any snow. <laughs> so it's just, I, I just don't like the heat of the south anymore, man. I just, oh, I get, I, I just, it, it's, it's just the older I get, the less I think I'm able to handle the heat. Um, and I'm actually somehow better able to handle the cold. It's just easier because it's not really cold. It's just cool outside. Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah, Nashville. Uh, I passed through Nashville a couple of times in life. It's kind of a big city with a small town feel, that kind of thing. That's the big thing. Good town. Music, a lot of good music in Nashville. You know, I'm a former musician, so I knew a guy who played with uh, Reba McIntyre's band. No, he was really he was a trumpet player and he was really good but um you know but um middle tennessee yeah uh you know, when you say middle tennessee i always think about like uh what's that wrestler guy he was like a wrestling promoter um i can't think of his name if i mentioned it jim crockett or what well, i gotta forget his name but anyway peel and drag in the house. What's up, man? Talking shop. You know, a lot of people just, um, I think some people just think they're too old to start a YouTube channel. And they're not. You can, there's a ton of people on YouTube who are older people who are having every bit as much success on YouTube as the younger people. It's just, it's really not about the age. Um, it's, it just really isn't. It's not about age. It's not about skin color. It's not about nationality. It's about your ability to change people's lives. And that's about it. Oh, let me show you one other thing. I guess we can talk about some fishing. Um, where did I put it? Ah, uh, yeah, this is the rod here. This, since we have it here in the house, can we ask some fishing questions before you're done? Yes, always. Like, I want my live streams, I don't want my live streams to be a, a lecture. I'll have a few things to say, and I'll probably get impassioned about that every now and again, but I primarily want the live streams to be question and answer. I want you to ask questions, and I want it to be a dialogue. 
I want to talk to you. I want you to talk to me. Uh, and I want you guys to talk with each other in the in the chat. And also, you may not know, I don't know if you know this, but if you look at the bottom of the chat here, well, you can't, excuse me, you can't see it. There's a dollar sign. And if any of you feel that you want to contribute to the channel, maybe the products I have on the website are not all that interesting to you and you don't want a, a live, you don't want a whole bunch of whatever, you can do a live I don't know what they call that thing. What do they call it? A uh, super chat, I think they call it. You know, so you can donate it. Your chat goes to the top and stays pinned up. I think a lot of youngsters like it. I don't know, but it's there if you feel interested. But anyway, whatever. What can we ask some fishing questions before you're done, or do you do live stream? No, all my live streams are church and answer. So whatever fishing questions you ask, just ask them, and I'll just stop what I'm talking about and answer it. Uh, but until then, uh, this is the fly rod that I was using the other day. As you can see it's just an old Phillips and six seven weight fly rod. Can you see that? It's wanting to focus on my eyes. Phillips and six seven weight blank. Six or seven weight blank. I bought this used. Bought this thing pretty expensive. Bought it for about $150. I had to put some new eyes on here there over time. <laughs> kind of butchered. As you can see, I've greatly neglected this fly rod. <laughs> I'm not taking care of it. I've greatly neglected it. Um, as you can see, that's what I was fishing with on the last video. But I love it. And I love fiberglass because it, it's just so bendy. I don't fly fish, but I'm interested in spin fishing flies to whoa! <laughs> UP Gardner. Oh, <laughs> this is my first uh super chat. Cheers. He says cheers. Hey man, thanks. <laughs> oh, that's kind of neat. Um, I'm grateful for it. That money will go for gas in the that'll pay for gas for the boat for like I don't know how much is gas running in you guys' area. I think I paid a dollar seventy-four today for no, no, yeah, for the car. I always put premium in the boat because the motor's all steroided up and stuff, so it's more. It's like two thirty or something. So thank you for that. Um, two seventeen. Yeah, that's not too bad. I Man, I think they can keep the gas prices below like two fifty a gallon. I think that's. That's going to help a lot of people out. So hope they can do that. But anyway, Desperado, Desperate Desperado. I don't fly fish, but I'm interested in spin fishing flies to expand my tackle. How do you match the hatch and know what to throw? Yeah, $4 a gallon does hurt. I mean, I just you basically can't buy gas. It's almost like... I'll just go buy a bicycle and fish from the bank. <laughs> you know, it's like four dollars is too painful. But but anyway, how how do you in fact uh desperate desperado that, that's exactly um I've 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 done that. I do that all the time. I in fact um most of my fishing that you see before um my fishing is basically the same no matter what system I use. I'm always using a fly tip with bait, right? That and the fly rod or the hand line, I don't have a hand line with me, or spinning gear or bait casting gear, those are just delivery systems. And I may need to do some videos to show you how to do some either what they call float and fly technique or how to do um, match. So your question was how to match the hatch. How do you know what to throw? Okay. Um, sorry, you're new to the channel. So how do you know what to throw in matching the hatch? Um, first of all, the question is, is, one, are you only interested in throwing sort of artificials or lures or flies only? Are you uninterested in completely uninterested in 
fishing with live bait or dead bait or cut bait or any other type of bait, whether it be crappie nibbles of any type. If that's the case, then yes, the fly is going to have to match the hatch to have any chance of catching a fish. And how do you approach that? How do you know what's to throw? I think the, the bass fishermen have a lot, believe it or not, I think bass fishing has a lot to offer here. Because bass fishing study the fish that they're targeting, whether it's bass, bluegill, whatever. And they study those fish, their habitats, their, the, where they stay, the structure, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Then they begin to look at, okay, what do they eat? And then they choose whatever hard rubber, hard rubber, hard uh, soft plastic, hard lure that they are going to try to simulate to get that. Whereas fly fishermen generally will just study lots and lots and lots of bugs and try to replicate those bugs. But at some point, like you say, the, the, the clutch has got to mesh to the transmission in order to, to get it going. Every stream and river has minnows in it. Minnows, shad, and any number of what you call bait fish. All right. And the first type of fly that I tied and had I don't have an example of one. Lots and lots and lots of success was what they call streamers. Streamers are roughly designed to um, the material streams over the hook or under the hook, depending on how you make them. And they're designed to simulate bait fish. So that's the first look for the get on your get on your. um what do you call it? The the DNR Wildlife and Natural Resources website should have something where they will list out the different species of bait fish that live in your waters, right? Literally, go type that in and look at the the number and the variety. And whatever is sort of the most popular type of bait fish in your waters, that's the kind of fly you want to sort of start with in a variety of sizes, right? A lot of people, now a lot of, formally speaking, I'm not a fly fisherman. Fly fishermen typically tie flies and only fish flies. I don't actually tie flies. I basically tie bait harnesses, okay? Um, but even a streamer is not really a fly. It's a streamer. I'm, a, I'm more of a streamer fisherman. The first success I've ever had was tying streamers. And the most success I had is tying these sort of attraction bait harness types of things. So start with bait fish. And then you decide, look at what the live bait fishermen are fishing with and try to replicate that. Okay. Now, depending on the river, it can be hard to know see the one of the big problems is is the rivers are so deep and so wide you can't get to the bottom of the river to pick up the rocks and the logs to actually look at them to see what's growing there you just can't okay so it's a little bit of a guessing game but you can look and see what actually works if you get out and see when the mayfly bite is happening you that's obvious a mayfly you could use but in every lake, you're going to find dragonflies. You're going to find damselflies. Damselflies, dragonflies live as aquatic insects under the water before they emerge. That's why you hear fly fishermen talk about emerging patterns and all this kind of thing. They're so dialed into all the various stages of development of each insect that they could pick the exact size and color of the insects that are in their waters to replicate that. Well, it's easy if the stream you're in is only four feet deep. You can just literally reach down and pick up a rock and see what's under it. I just don't have that luxury. All right. So, but another thing to do is 
the best thing to do is look at the structure. If you have a rocky structure, it's obviously crawfish are going to live there. Look at this. If it's a sandy bottom, you know there's probably going to be worms in that sand. That, you know, you know, um, you know. Uh, by and large, when it comes to fishing, fly fishing in multi species and in warm water, you need to look at almost all insects eat almost all insects. Almost all fish eat insects at some stage in their lives. All right. The size of those insects, the shape of those, the, the colors, all that might vary. But the thing with fish is all you have to do is get close. You don't have to mimic it exactly as people might have you think. We're trying to approximate what the fish are seeing, not replicate. That's my philosophy anyway, which is why this works well. I'm using super worms that I've got growing over here by the door here tip with that fly there approximates something that those fish see all the time in the water i can't tell you what that is because i just don't have a way to see it there's not a sonar in the world that could tell you <laughs> what's down there below those rocks without you getting scuba gear and diving down there okay um and so that's a bit of a guessing game that's why I recommend people would fish for a year with live bait, fish all kinds of live bait and see which live bait catches you more fish and then begin to replicate those live baits uh, in your fly tying and in your fly fishing purposes. OK, that's how I would um, recommend that. OK, let's see. Still put them in near the old spillway. Yes, I think he's talking to them. Uh, fiberglass somebody i think mike takes the gun was talking about my fly rod yeah so this is fiberglass that's all i fish i'm i'm i gotta have stuff that works graphite's too um flimsy for me it's too brittle i like the lightweightness of fiberglass i like the strength for um i like the uh the fact that it can it's because it's so stiff, it can transmit the energy really well. Whereas this thing just flops around like a, like a tree limb, <laughs> right? But for trolling and drifting, you just can't beat fiberglass. So give me fiberglass any day on a fly rod. I want to build a new fly rod, a two-handed fly rod, and um, I really want a bamboo, but just can't find a source. Whoa, five dollars. Wait a minute. What happened? Wow. Desperate. $5. Thanks, dude. All right. This, this, I can't pronounce. I can't talk right now. $5. $5. So, so thanks, man. I greatly appreciate that. Again, get to buy gas for the, get to buy gas for the, for the boat. That's what I, that's where that money will go. Tenkara fly fishing is about imitating movement, not looking. See, and now that's what I'm talking about. Dave Musgrove. That's it. That's it. Um, you know, it, you're never going to imp perfectly imitate nature. It's just not going to happen. The fish know it's fake, right? <laughs> they, they know it's fake. They're not dumb. That's why live bait works so well. But, you know, I know Tenkara fly fishing, which is, to me, cane pole fishing is what you're doing to contain cane pole. I know I don't want to be insulting. But the truth is, is that a lot of times, think about how bass fishing, how much it's the movement of the thing that's triggering those bass to bite. Sometimes it's just a reactionary bite, and that's what you want. And sometimes, you know, nymphing. Um, uh, nymphing is the um, same sort of thing. They're just mimicking the motion of these little, little, tiny little bugs that are just sort of get dislodged from the rocks and just drift down the stream. Right, and that motion is similar enough that they go. Fish don't see as well as we do. They really don't see as well as we do at all. They can feel vibration way better. In other words, their world is eight hundred times as dense as air, and so they can feel vibrations. Right? They have a superior, just as a dog has a superior sense of hearing and smell. They have a superior sense of touch and smell. They can smell very well. They can, and. Uh, 
And so, yeah. And so as long as you can get close and you can approximate it, that's what's most important. And uh, that's what you really want to do. Let's see what else we got here. We've got some flies. I want to send you warm water stuff tied. Okay. Mike takes the gun. Yeah. Um, send me a private message or something, and I can give you my email. At, I can give you my address or something. It's Damon at BlackWarriorLures.com. Or you can just, I think, I'm pretty sure YouTube still has a private message here. People send me flies all the time. I, um, I've, I've got a bunch of flies that let me show you that have been sent. Well, these are some I've tied up. It's ugly here, but I've got people send me flies all the time. You know, I, I, things that I actually want to review and show here on the vice on the video and stuff. Just haven't gotten around to that. Um, and so. You know, I'd love to for you to send me some flies. I've got some in the mailbox now that I got to get out. A fellow that sent me, um, um, gosh, I forget his name. He, he quotes all, he talks all the time. Killer bug fly worth great and doesn't look like anything specific. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Where's my other book? Another way to match the hatch is to start reading fly fishing books. Get start. I like. I, I've always wondered if I should start writing little books like this. Um, most people consume with video now instead of reading, but this is my. This is probably my favorite fly fishing book of all time. Bluegill Fly Fishing and Flies by Terry and Roxanne Wilson. I don't even know if it's in print anymore. Um, but let me show you. First of all, he does it just like an in fisherman magazine. He goes through the seasons and looks at what where the fish are holding and where they're targeting. Um, let's look at some of these flies here. It's focusing. You see some of those flies? It looks like junk, dude, right? I mean, it's not junk. Yeah, go on eBay. There's tons of good flies on eBay in, in addition to my own website if you want. Um, a lot of that, I mean, look at this right here, dude. What the heck does that look like? I don't look like anything. This looks like a big monster. It looks like, what the heck? You know, one of my favorite flies here, the Mickey Finn. You see me do that yellow, red, yellow all the time because that's a color pattern that triggers a lot of fish to bite in my waters. And I can't explain why. It just works. The bluegill spider, that's the fly that the author of the book, uh, the, the window, invented. And then you have little nice little sort of flies like this that I really like a lot, but are not necessarily, again, nymphs. Nymphs are uh, aquatic insects like dragonfly nymphs. Um, streamers are really my favorite sorts of flies. I think streamers are the most beautiful flies. And you see this fly right here? That th look, you, uh, you see that? All right. You think maybe I've been influenced in any way? You see what I'm saying? A lot of possibilities. You see what I'm saying? So study fly fishing books like this. Oh, you said go on eBay, the book 1995. Okay, good, good. Thank you for letting people know about that. So you can find that book. And look, the way I look at it, bluegill eat the same thing trout eat. And you can start from there and then you can build up. I took that that thumper fly there or whatever that's called. I forget what it's called. Uh, thunder spin fly. It's called thunder spin. There's a misprint there. And I just upsized it. I'm thinking, I wonder if that would make a good catfish fly. All right? It's that thumper there. And uh, I just haven't had much time to get out and test it. But um, uh I think this this blade is a little bit too big and heavy for it. It kind of re rides bottom down, like almost like a almost like an F fifteen or something trying to land. That's what that is. Like, it's miserable. Okay, so yeah. Um, let's see if we have any other comments. Um. 
I knew I was going to end up talking about fishing before too long. <laughs> so any of you, anyone want to get started in YouTube, you know the answer. Just, just start. I wanted to come back to this part in this book because I've been looking at some keywords and people have been asking about fly fishing boats and things, which is weird. Uh, as much as I love canoes and kayaks, oh, come on, really? Let's see if I can find the part here. Read it. Yeah, right here. The ordinary aluminum boats may be inexpensively customized by adding plywood platforms, carpeting, uh, adding pit padded swivels. You know, just you got a big picture of this guy in a John boat just fishing. <laughs> you see that? You know, I'm doing this in, in good faith here. Um, what do you call that stuff? Uh, you know. You don't have to have expensive boat to fly fish. Just a little John boat works real fine. You know, 10-foot car topper, you know, about what I got. You know, um, you know, you know, you know, and the fish don't know what you're fishing out of. I mean, just you just all hook fin style, you know. <laughs> it's not all that much different than fishing with a cane pole it really isn't it's just it's just sort of it's just a it's just a little bit more practical version or a little bit more um, what do you call it um, you can do more with the fly rod because you can cast it or you can fish it like a cane pole or you can drag it like a it's versatile it's a more versatile if you ask me but anyway um, let me show you another book Um, another one that I love, and I'm probably going to start buying more of these. Who is this? He, oh, he, everything's backward. I didn't realize that. Uh, Side Drifting for Steelhead. This is by Amato Books, A M A T O Books.com. He publishes lots of little books like these. Can you see? It, it doesn't want to focus. So, um, again, same thing. You know, you guys hear me talking about drifting and trolling, and you know, you know, I'm just taking what people have done in other parts of the world, and just adapting it for my purposes. So you're kind of taking this and combining it with this to get something that just didn't quite exist before. Um, you know, and and this guy's catching steelhead with like spinning tackle. He's not using big five hundred dollar spay rods and two handed fly rods. <laughs> He's just just spinning tackle, right? And you talk about matching the hatch. Let me show you. Uh, let's see. Oh come on here. Oh come on. Remember the uh, remember the Afro puff fly I've been tying. Look at that egg sacks. You know, just a slight variation on it. Just toned it down for my parts. You remember the uh, the 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 way I cure my chicken livers for catfish? That three two one borax recipe. This is what salmon steelhead guys do. They, they do it with the row eggs. You know, salmon and steelhead, say hey from Florida, Keith Howell. Hey, man, what's up? You're, you're the one who keeps asking me about my boat. I got to get out here and get started on that thing. It's finally dried out. and oh, The wood's still in decent shape, so I should be getting back on that. Um, you know, Lear, you know, remember the Afro puff I'm talking? And this is what, you know, you know, and so... And I, I don't, I don't, to me, steelhead are some of the most beautiful fish in the whole world, you know. But anyway, um, uh, that is, it, it, this whole book is just spinning gear. He's just using spinning gear, but he's drifting in the same way. You remember the, the Afro puff here? 
Same. They got it all rigged up on the hooks and everything. Same thing down here. You know, I'm using, I've taken this, this, um, this salmon and steelhead bait harness approach, and I'm applying it to my waters in my situation to test and see if it works. And it does. They're just taking these puff balls and combining it with um, actual egg sacs as bait, whereas I'm just making a sort of a half puff ball or even a quarter puff ball and tipping it with worms. That's really the only difference. And the truth be told is, let's see if we can find it. <laughs> Let me show you something. Steelhead eat worms too. Nightcrawler with a puff ball. You see that? Only difference is his puff ball is at the back. My puff ball tends to come at the front. My hook's a little bit smaller. My line's a little lighter. But a lot of these guys will fish with 8 and 10 and 12 pound test line, which is about as heavy as I want to run anyway. So a lot of my techniques come from that. A lot of my technique comes from um, hand line fishermen on the Detroit River. A lot of my methods come from just things my dad taught me, uh, like the floats, fishing floats, which I don't have any of those. And by the way, anybody who wants to purchase those, it's best to start getting your orders in now because once the first full warm front of February hits, I'll be almost like everybody wants their floats and they want them now. And so if you really want to get your floats fast, it's best to order them now. Uh, I don't even have an example, but I've got a batch here that is ready for the next thing. But um, I don't know. I'm not going to waste any time with that. And so uh, I'm trying to think what other... I don't think I have anything else today. So we covered starting a YouTube channel, covered fishing. Uh, check these guys out. If you're interested in any kind of drift fishing, check out what the salmon and steelhead guys do. Check out what cat and compare it to what cat the way cat fishermen like Steve Douglas and do their cat fishing drifting with. And compare the two, and you'll see there's a lot of similarities. The main difference is. They're just different species and you're on a different water, but the basic and the dudes in different gear, but the principles are almost exactly the same. You're just having to adapt it for a different fish in different waters. I mean, it works pretty well. Never too old. Just have a great content and I sub. Good. Thanks, man. What's up, brother? I'm Southern Indiana. I'm trying to think. If I've ever been to, I think I passed through Indiana on the way to Chicago once. On a gig. I like Chicago. It's a pretty nice town. I think I passed through Indianapolis once or twice. I've always wanted to go to the big race up there. I mean, it's kind of funny. I live in Alabama. We've got like the biggest closed circuit track in the world, Talladega. And I'm thinking, about, oh, I want to go to Indy. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> let's go to Indy. <laughs> Why? Because it's legendary. You know, you, people follow legends. Legends are awesome. And Indianapolis is like, if there's one race you want to go to, it's Indy, right? I mean, even NASCAR races at Indy now, right? So that's cool. Um, but um, okay, so um, my voice is getting a little raw, and I've got orders that I have, I need to. See got about three orders that are outstanding with those hand line. If anybody realize, if you check out the pricing on the hand line reels, they have gone up because they take so much time and they are so hard on my equipment to make that. Let me go get one for I'll be right back. Okay, so, yeah, these are my handline reels uh, that I turn on my lathe. I've got these two. I've got one more that are going out, and i got to make another blank for someone. Um, they take a long time to make, and they, they 
they really hard on my equipment. And so it's just taking longer and longer for me to produce these. And so I had to raise the price of them. Um, okay, so Ben Hobson, we actually come down there and fish Wheeler. It's on the Tennessee. Yeah. And good smallmouth. See, I have never in all my life caught a smallmouth bass. We get lots of spot bass here because the spots are seem to fight a lot like smallmouth. But if I was going to do bass fishing, I, I really think that it's the smallies, the smallies, you know, that's just, I don't know, it's something about that little bass. It's ferocious, ornery fish, you know. And I think that's why I like the spotted bass. We get a lot of spotted bass down here, which are almost like a hybrid between largemouth and smallies. So, yeah, it seems like the smallies are the little bass. And, well, striped bass, a true bass, but of the black bass, you know, the smallies, man, yeah. But anyway, um, all right, fellas, my voice is absolutely raw. Just taking consideration that it's, it's taking me a long time to make these. And I had to raise the pricing on it so I could free up more time to do things like this because I want to talk with you guys, I want you to talk to me, I want you to talk to each other, that kind of thing. And uh, but I got to sign off because I got to get. I want to get these out. I would rather get these out this week, if not by Monday. Um, and uh, I will see you guys on the next one. Just uh, I'm gonna try to keep doing these on most Fridays, these live chats, and I always, always, always want the live chats to be a conversation. I don't want it to be a lecture. I want you guys to ask questions, talk with each other. I'll answer, and we, and so it's sort of organic. So it is, it's, the live chats are always going to be Q&A, and I may have a theme, I may not. Um, ate what a burger like that. Doctor, don't want me to have it. I gotta go clean catfish and get orders done. So uh, I appreciate all you guys who have given me the time of day here. Uh, I greatly appreciate it. Go and buy my stuff. <laughs> oh my gosh.